Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing this night. We will take hold of what you declare, be doers of it. We'll see the fruit of it in our life. Thank you for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We shared with you beginning this morning on the subject of faith. Very important. We talked about many things that we would think of as the ingredients of faith that we, you and I must have in operation. We'll just cover a few things, but we aren't going to be able to go through much of what we talked about. We covered many important areas this morning. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. You must understand that just because you're born again doesn't mean that you're in the faith from what God's talking about. If you're in the faith, you're operating according to faith. You're walking by faith. You're living by faith. You're doing the things that He says. You are to examine yourself, to test yourself. And this is a command. You and I are commanded, imperative mood verb, to examine yourself, whether you truly are in the faith. We talked about the fact that there's only one faith. You're either in it or not. We talked about the fact that faith is a mystery. <clears throat> And we're to walk, walk in line with it as God reveals the mysteries to us. <clears throat> we also talked about the fact that there is a battle for the true faith that was once delivered to the saints because the devil has worked to bring all kinds of false teachings, unfortunately. At the same time, you must understand, as we pointed out, there's two aspects to faith. There is a spirit of faith that you have when you got born again, we saw this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. You have a spirit of faith when you got born again. You are to you use your spirit of faith and function by it. How do, what, what do I do with it? You mix it with the word of God that you hear that comes into your heart, which produces specific faith. We point it out. From Romans, chapter 10, verse 17, we saw, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word, rhema, the spoken word of God. When you hear the word, the word gets in your heart and it produces faith. It also gets in your mind and produces hope. You must mix that with your general spirit of faith. And we talked about this, but we'll look at this scripture again for a moment. Hebrews 4, verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise of being left us, of entering into his rest, that any of us should seem, should seem to come short of it. We're all to enter into the promises. That's how you enter into his spiritual rest. You're not to come short in any promise. How are you going to do it? Through the word. Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. When you hear the word, what does it do? It produces faith in your heart. But notice, the word preached did not profit them. Why didn't it profit them? Because not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. If the word preached produces specific faith in you, then why would it not profit us? It's because you have to mix it with your general spirit of faith, believing that word and speaking it and acting upon it and doing what it says to put your faith in operation. Now we also talked about many things, but one of the things we talked about is God wants to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. We saw it out of 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. God wants your faith to come to perfection. He wants it to be producing results and victory in your life. But you must perfect that which is lacking in your faith. We talked about the fact that the Word, of course, is the source of faith. The word is to be in your heart and mind, mouth, as we talked about. You are to believe God's word, and if you believe it, you will act upon it. At the same time, you are going to be looking at the unseen realm, not the seen realm. And one of the things we pointed out, which we'll point out again for a moment, you cannot be focused on the natural realm and be in faith. Faith is that which is of the spirit. It is a law of faith. It is a spirit of faith that you function and put into operation. Romans 4.19 
being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. You cannot consider the natural state of things. If you do, you'll be weak in faith. Instead, you're to consider the Word. You're to consider the promise. You're to consider the things in the realm of the unseen, that God has given you authority over all the power of the devil, and all the promises have already been given to you, and you are to take hold of them with your faith. If you look at the natural realm, you will not be operating in faith. You'll be weak in faith. We do not look at the things that are going on in the natural. Many people, as we talked about, they flip-flop back and forth. They're in the spirit one minute, and then they're looking at the natural and responding to the natural the next minute. No, that causes you to be weak in faith. We don't consider what's going on in the natural. That means not saying we ignore it. We're not saying we deny it. It's there. But what we understand is that faith operates in the spirit to receive the power of God or the promises of God and release the power of God to destroy the works of the enemy and to take hold of the promises which are all spiritual blessings. As you operate in the spirit, then things will come into the natural realm and manifest. But you cannot be considering the natural realm, otherwise it will affect your faith. And that is very important. In other words, we're to operate in the spirit and stay focused in the realm of the spirit. We talked about having hope. We talked about the steadfastness of faith. We talked about being fully persuaded. We talked about being diligent with long suffering. We talked about many things that are important. And we're going to pick up with where we've stopped and continue on on these important principles of faith. Romans chapter 10, in verse 8, we did see this scripture. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Is that talking about the written word? No. It's the word rhema, means that which is spoken. Meaning the word is to be coming out of your mouth. You are to be speaking it. The spoken word is nigh you. It's to be in your mouth and in your heart. So it's going to be in your heart, but you're going to be speaking it to release it out. That's how you put faith in operation. One of the ways is by speaking. The other way, of course, is by doing what he says. It's the spoken word of faith which we preach. As you put your faith in operation, you will see God will be working on your behalf. And there's many ways that you're going to put it in operation. Here's one of the ways in Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Verily I say unto you ever, Say unto you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, and what do you say? A mountain would be something that's blocking you or hindering you. That would be an evil spirit doing something to hinder you from accomplishing something. It would be on the outside. Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. You command that mountain or that blockage or that hindrance to be removed. You speak commanding words to it. You are releasing your faith for it to be removed. You shall not doubt in your heart. If you doubt, that shuts down your faith. We cannot doubt. We must believe God's word. And he says, but shall believe that those things which he saith, the King James says, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. We do have to make a comment here. When it says, believe those things which he saith, am I supposed to speak this one time or am I supposed to speak it more than once? That is a critical point. The way we know it is by looking at the word saith, where I have the cursor over and highlighted it. When we look at this, we find that the tense of this, tense of this verb is a present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action. So, we believe that those things which we say and continue to say, we don't just say it once, we continue to speak. Every time you speak, you're putting your faith in operation. Then, do we believe it shall come to pass in the future? Is that faith in operation? No. Why? Because faith is always doing something now, releasing something now, and having an effect now. When it says shall come to pass, is that correct in the Greek? No. How do we know? We have to look everything up. 
This is the word ginnamite, which means to become or come to pass. It can mean that in this context. When you look at this word, you find that it is a present tense. Wait a minute, here it is. Ginnamite. Yeah, it's a present tense, I'm sorry. Present tense instead of a future tense. If it was shall come to pass, it'd be a future tense. But it's not a future tense. It's a present tense. How would you translate this? Shall believe that those things which he says and continues to say are coming to pass. Meaning, they are happening. Because the present tense is something is happening now. You are speaking things into being and you are believing that those things which you are saying, commanding that mountain to be removed, are coming to pass. That is critical. Whether you're casting out demons, or you're speaking to a mountain, or you're taking hold of a promise, or whatever it might be, faith is always released now when you speak, and you continue to speak it, and you must know, believe, that it is happening now. If not, if you think it shall come to pass, you're not in faith, you're in hope instead. Faith operates now. It releases things to come to pass. When you command demons to come out in the name of Jesus, the power of God is going into operation. Your faith is working now. You believe that it's working now to bring those spirits out and the power of God is working. You continue to command them to come out and they start coming out. We can understand that in casting out demons, it's very simple. We need to believe the same thing, whether you're speaking to a mountain or whether you're interceding and taking dominion in the heavenlies, casting down these spirits, or whether we're speaking promises into being. You must believe that these things are happening now. Faith always declares what God is doing now. And that is a critical point. And then you'll have whatsoever he saith. Now, another thing that's important as far as applying your faith. So we see that's uh, something that we do ongoing. Here's another case which we mentioned about casting out demons and here's one specific. This is a man who had demons in him and he had the unclean spirit, he cried out, the demon was speaking through him. And we come to verse 25 and what did Jesus do with that spirit? He rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. So he was commanding this demon to come out of him. How did he say it? Did he say it one time? It looks like it, but that's not what the Greek says. When I put the cursor over the word saying, the word saying is in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So what does that mean? He was continually saying, hold thy peace and come out of him, hold thy peace and come out of him, hold thy peace and come out of him. He continued to speak. Every time he spoke, it released his faith. It released the authority and the power of God to cause this spirit to come out. Well, what happened? Verse 26, when the unclean spirit had torn him, it didn't come out right away. It tore him a little bit and cried with a loud voice and he came out of him. Obviously, it was fighting within him. It was tearing at him. And it even had a loud voice like a scream or something, whatever. And he finally came out. That means the demon was fighting. The same thing is true over in Mark chapter 9. Verse 25, Jesus saw the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit saying, and how did he say it? Continuously, present tense, not just one time. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. This is because of the fact that it had come in from inheritance. But he didn't speak just once, he kept speaking it. And why was this? The spirit cried and ran him sore, came out of him. He was as one dead, insomuch that many said he's dead. This guy seemed to go through it worse. Ran him sore. Finally came out. In fact, the guy fell down like he was dead. Those are extreme cases. Should that make you afraid of deliverance? No. We see this one out of 10,000 cases or whatever. Demons come out easily with yawns, coughs, sighs, burps, belches. They shouldn't be throwing anybody around all. If you know how to get them out, you get them coughing out and get these spirits releasing out of them. It's nothing to be afraid of whatsoever. These are here to show you that these things could happen, and they happen in the face of Jesus. At the same time, we cast out the demons, and they come out rather easily. 
as you just continue to command them to come out. You say and continue to say. You just keep speaking and they will start coming out. And you keep on applying your faith to drive them out. Another thing that we do is anything that we're speaking into being, it's the same thing. We did see this in Romans 4, 17. The latter part of this verse says, I calleth those things which be not as though they were. The word calleth is in the present tense, meaning continuous, ongoing, repeated action. He was calling continually. Those things which be not, unfortunately it says as though they were, which is a mistake in the Greek. This has given rise to a false teaching that we should only speak one time and that we should declare that things are already done. Otherwise, we call something be not as though it already was, it already is done. Is that correct? No. How do we know? We have to look things up. And that's why I bring everything up on the screen so I can prove it to you. So I'm not off in left field. You see it yourself. When it says be, it is a present participle, means being. Call those things not being continually. If it was were, it would be changed to some kind of a past tense, right? The watch when I put the cursor over the word were. It's the exact same word. A present participle, and it means being. It should be translated, calling those things which are not being as being. Not as though it already was done, but calling things into being to bring them into being. And you do it continuously because it is present tense. Young's literal that we brought up here, we put it up here because it corrects the King James errors in many, many cases and brings the correct rendering from the Greek. Look what he says. Is calling the things that be not as being. That is correct. In other words, faith is going to speak into being things that are not being as being as far as bringing them into being. You're speaking them into being. Call things not happening as being. They're happening now. You're speaking it into being. As you do so, you're releasing your faith to bring that into manifestation. We also pointed this out, and we'll show you again. You don't, may not know Greek, but here is Scriveners, which is the basis for the King James. Here is the first word, if you see it down here. It is a present participle. Here's the second word, present participle. They're the exact same word in the Greek, indicating the fact that it goes from be to be, not to were. That makes all the difference in the world. If I am going to be calling something as not being as being continuously, then I am going to be speaking it into being, declaring what God is doing now, speaking it into being. For instance, let's say a promise such as healing. The Bible says that Jesus took our infirmities, bore away our sicknesses, by his stripes we were healed, Healing belongs to us. It's now a promise of God. So we would come boldly to the throne of grace, declare what the word says, and if healing is not happening in my body now, that would be the not being part, I am going to speak it into being, declaring that it is flowing into me, which is it is being or occurring in me now. That is putting my faith in operation. So I'd say, Heavenly Father, because your word declares Jesus took my infirmities, bore away my sicknesses, by his stripes I was healed, it's my right. I therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. I take hold of your healing. I thank you that your healing power is flowing into my body, healing me now. I'm declaring, calling what's not happening, it's happening, it's being, it's happening, it's occurring. You're speaking it into being. Think about what Jesus did every place. He went and said, be healed. What was he doing? Releasing healing into the person. Be opened, to open the ears. Be loosed, to loose the tongue. He would speak things, be made whole. What was he doing? He was doing exactly this, speaking things into being. That's what you do. You speak the promises of God into being and keep speaking them into being until you see the manifestation of them. That is how you release faith. That is important. Another thing that we do, when we pray, 
And we've talked about this in the past. We won't get into this detailed, but we'll just give you the present tense aspect of it. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto what things soever you desire, it's the word iteo, which means a demand of what's due you, which is making, bringing the scripture promise to, God, to the Father. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, is this something I do once? This is the prayer of faith. No. How do we know? If you look up all four of these verbs, desire, pray, believe, and receive, which we'll show you right now, you will see that every single one of them are present tense, meaning continuous, repeated action. Here's the word for pray. You can see it down here. Present tense. Here's the word for believe. Same thing. Present tense. Same thing with receive. Present tense. Why are we showing you this? So you show, so we understand that praying is praying continuously. Not this one-time stuff. It is great error. Faith, what is this telling you? Faith is released continuously. You keep praying. You pray without ceasing. You keep casting out. You keep speaking to the mountain. You keep speaking promises into being. You keep speaking, declaring what God is doing now for you, that healing power is flowing in your body. You keep speaking it into being. It's true of whatever you're confessing. Here's another example. Hebrews chapter 4. When it speaks about holding fast our confession of a promise to speak it into being. Look what it says. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, and what is he doing? He takes what you speak and speaks it before the Father and speaks it before the angels. So what should we be doing? Let us hold fast our profession or confession or what we are speaking into being. Hold fast. What does that tense mean? present tense, meaning I am to continually hold fast to speaking, professing, confessing the promises of God coming into being. And by the way, this one really says, may we hold fast, means it's not automatically is Jesus' high priestly ministry working for us unless we do this and meet the condition, but it's a subjunctive mood. Many people think that Jesus is automatically praying for him up there and doing things. No, if he was doing that, Every one of us should be healed, delivered, no problems ever. No, he is ready to do something with what you pray, but you got to pray to put him in operation. Same with his intercessory prayer ministry. It doesn't go into operation unless you pray to put him into operation. So, these are all important things. Speaking to the mountain, praying continuously to take hold of promises, casting out demons continually to drive demons out, speaking whatever it might be into being, the promises into being, holding fast your confession to see the Lord go into operation, to confess something before the Father and before the angels, to put them in operation. It's all to be done continuously. Faith is to be put in operation continuously. That tells you something. Is faith just something where I just believe something that God's going to do something? No. Believing that God is going to do something is hope. Believing that in, in, in the mind that he's going to. Believing in another aspect it is because we have faith in our heart. Believing in our heart would be faith. But does that produce the results? No, unless we work our faith. Let me give you an example. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and you believe that he's the one who will give you eternal life, can you just believe that and that produces it automatically? No. Look what it says. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them gave he the power, the right to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Just believing on his name, does that produce, makes you a son of God? No. What do you have to get? You've got to get a new spirit in you. Well, how do I get a new spirit? I'm going to receive him. When I receive him, then his spirit comes into me. 
Otherwise, many people that disbelieve, that's good, but then you do something after that. Because you believe, you take hold of it. In some aspect, you're applying your faith. You speak something into being. Remember, just believing doesn't put your faith in operation. We saw that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We, having the same spirit of faith as according to written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, then what do we do? Therefore we speak. Why? Because that releases our faith and puts it in operation. Believing alone will not do it. I hear many people say, well, I'm believing the Lord to heal me. That sounds like a nice statement. But that's not releasing healing to come into you. You can believe what God will do for you, but then the question is, what are you doing that's causing that healing to come into you? Or I believe that the Lord will deliver me. I'm believing God to deliver me from this problem. Well, that's great, but what are you doing to see him bring that forth? You're to be casting out the demons, or to be speaking to the mountain, or be speaking a promise into being, using your authority. And that is so important. Faith is to be put in operation by working your faith. In James chapter 2, we see some really important things brought out. Verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, it's dead. You can have faith, but it's dead in the sense that it's not operating. It's not doing anything. Being alone. Other words... The teaching that says faith alone is all you need is a lie. I'm going to be saved or born again, you know, I'll have eternal life because I just have faith alone. No. Faith alone is dead, it says right here. So you've got to have works. Faith has to have works. Now, are we saved by our works? No. We're saved by faith and also works of faith combined. For instance, if I believe that Jesus is the Savior and I'm to be born again, so I'm believing, I have faith for with that promise, but then what do I do? My work of faith is receiving him so he comes on the inside of me and I get a brand new spirit, so I'm working my faith. <coughs> so faith has to have works. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, your faith will be shown by your works or your actions. If you believe that Jesus is your healer and it's a promise for you, you will pray a prayer of faith and take hold of that healing for it to flow into your body. That's your work of faith, your action of praying to take hold of it. If you believe that you have authority over a demon to cast it out and it doesn't have any right to stay in you whatsoever and you can get rid of it, that's great. But it's not going until you speak to it and command it to come out in the name of Jesus. Otherwise, you had to work your faith. You had to put it in operation. Your faith will be shown by your works. Verse 20, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? He's really saying, you should have known this, essentially, because the word vain means someone who is devoid of truth. Otherwise, there are those that just didn't get the truth about this. They were devoid of truth. Well, we see the same problem today. Many people do not understand that faith has to have works. Faith without works is dead. It's not doing anything. You can believe God's word, but if you don't act on it, it's not doing anything for you at all if you don't put it in operation. You can believe that Jesus died for you, paid the price, and he's the way for you to be, get born again and, and have eternal life and so forth, but if you don't receive him, he's never come into you. You have to do your, the work part, which is so important. Now notice what he says. Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he'd offer Isaac his son upon the altar. Yeah, he was. His work showed that he believed. Seeing how faith wrought, or working together, this means, with his works, by works was faith made perfect. Now, that's an important point. 
your faith needs to come to perfection or completion to produce results, meaning works of faith. We're not, by the way, we're not talking about works of you in the flesh. No, we're talking about works of faith, working your faith, doing what the Word says. Because faith came from the Word, and then when you work the Word, like you believe, but then when you speak, that's a work, isn't it? I'm speaking, I'm doing a work of faith. That's an example. And your faith will be made perfect, or come to perfection and produce the results. Verse 24, this is an important scripture. The whole world that believes that you're saved by faith alone needs to look at this scripture. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified or rendered righteous, and not by faith. This is the word manon, which means only or alone. The teaching that says we're saved by faith alone is a lie and teaching from the devil. It is deceived millions of Christians. Instead, we are saved by faith and works of faith by acting and doing what the Word says to see our faith produce the results of it, whether it's the new birth or whatever it might be. This is certainly important. So works of faith have to be put in operation. It shows it with Rahab. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out another way? Yeah, her works. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If your body doesn't have the spirit in it any longer, is there any life? Nope. Faith without works, is it doing anything? Is it alive? Nope. It's doing nothing. It's dead also. God wants you to put your faith in operation and work your faith. That is absolutely essential. As you work your faith, you are bringing hope into being. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance. This refers to that which is the underlying reality or that which is standing under, of things hoped for. Hope is the Greek word elpizo. Elpizo means hope, which means a confident expectancy. That's what this word means. It is a, a ex expectancy uh, in elpis, the specific word, which is what the root of it is, is a confident expectancy of something. Hope doesn't bring something into being. Hope is like, I have a confident expectancy that this promise will come to pass because of what the Word says. Because hope is the Word written in your mind in the soulish realm. So you have a, in your mind, you have a confident expectancy of what God will do. What brings it into being? Your faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It is going to bring things into being. And here is a scripture that is important to understand. Your confession of speaking forth the word is actually speaking forth your hope to bring it into being. And the speaking of your hope is your faith released. We can prove that with this verse here. Unfortunately, we have a problem in the King James translation. Let's read it in the King James first, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. It looks like I'm supposed to be confessing my faith. I put the cursor over the word faith. It's the word el peace, which is the word for hope. This word is translated 54 times in the New Testament in the Greek. Fifty-three times correctly translated hope in the King James Version. One time erroneously translated faith, and that's in this verse right here. You go look in all the other translations, they all translate it hope. It's amazing that they did miss this up. Let us hold fast the profession of hope. Otherwise, 
you are speaking your hope. What's the hope? The promise of God. The confident expectancy of what God will do, that promise. The confession of our hope is the release of our faith. In other words, we're speaking the hope into being. Let's say the hope is that healing belongs to me, it's a promise. So I'm going to speak the hope of healing into being by confessing, speaking something into being, which is what you're going to do. You're going to declare healing is flowing into your body as you take hold of it. You do this, this is important to understand. So confessing the word is confessing your hope. And when you are confessing your word, the word, you are releasing your faith to bring that hope into being. This is how Jesus did everything as far as controlling what was going on and bringing things forth. You're going to do the same thing. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking about Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. The word upholding is a word that's been translated the majority of times to bring something into being or to bring it forth. Upholding or bringing into being or bringing forth all things by the rhema, the spoken word of his power. In other words, it wasn't just Jesus believing that everything would work out fine. He spoke it into the word of his power into being to release the power of God so everything did come out fine. All the promises came to pass. He was protected. All the things that God wanted to speak came into being. He spoke those things into being. You are going to uphold or to bring forth or bring into being all things by the spoken word as well. Your speaking is putting your faith in operation. This is why you've got to make your mouth work for you. Every time you sing that song, it ought to be just reiterating this and re, re, getting this stamped in you that you need to put your mouth in operation and make it work for you to release your faith, to bring things into being. And that's important. Now, the working of your faith, this is supposed to happen. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, remember without ceasing your work of faith. Faith is a work. You work your faith. Your labor of love and your patience, this means steadfastness of hope. We're going to be steadfast of hope, having the word in our mind, in our soul, established. We believe the promise. We have hope. We have a confident expectancy of what we'll do. He's going to do, and he'll perform it, and we don't waver or doubt about it. But when you put it, your, this hope into operation, essentially, by working your faith, that brings the hope into being. You're working your faith. God wants us to understand we're going to work our faith. As you work your faith, what's going to happen? It tells us over in 2 Thessalonians, the second letter he wrote to them in verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, or it could be translated even in power. It's the word en in the Greek. It can be translated in, by, or with. That's primarily what it's translated. Most of the time, in. 1,874 times of the 2,784 uses. The work of faith in power or with power, meaning when you work your faith, power is going to be released because you're working the word. You're speaking the word. You're doing the word in some aspect. This is why when it speaks about working out our own salvation, how is it going to get accomplished in your life? You're going to work it out, which is working your faith. And how are you going to do that? By always obeying the word of God. Obedience is your work of faith. Do I just believe what the Word says only? No, I obey it and do what it says. I'm working my faith. If the Bible says that, you know, if, if you, you're, you're to pray for 
to take hold of promises or something in your life? Yeah, I can believe that. I believe that if I pray, I'll take hold of the promises. Well, that's not going to produce them. But if I pray, as he says, that's my work of faith, isn't it? I'm doing something, working my faith, and then I'll see the results. So obedience is your work of faith. This is why you need to be obedient in doing the word. And you're working out your own salvation as you're obeying. So it's by speaking the word and or obeying the word or doing the word in some capacity. That's how you're working your faith to see something come into manifestation. Now, another thing. As you are working your faith, something's going to happen. Remember, we have the measure of faith. Amen. Sorry, a measure of faith. We saw it out of Romans 12, 3. God's given us all the faith we have need of. We don't need to pray for faith or want God to give us more faith. We already have all we need. So what, what's the difference between one person and another as far as what's going on in the faith, their faith? Well, their faith has to grow. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Look at the testimony about them that was spoken. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Let's meet because your faith groweth exceedingly. You have faith. It needs to grow exceedingly and become strong and become effective. Just like you have a muscle. It can be weak. It can be strong. If you exercise it and cause it to become strong, you're working essentially that, then it's going to develop. Faith is something that's going to be worked, which produces your faith to grow exceedingly. This is why working your faith is so important. And we see this in Luke chapter 17. The apostles saw all the things that Jesus was doing, and they saw the faith was operating, and boy, they said, boy, we need our faith getting strong and increased. Luke 17, verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. We, we, our faith needs to get stronger. So, he told them exactly what to do to cause your faith to increase and to grow and to become strong. Use it. How would I develop my muscles to get strong? Well, I'm going to exercise them, aren't I? If they sit around and do nothing, are they going to get strong? I believe that they can get strong. No, they're not going to do anything until you exercise them. You do something. What do you do with your faith? You work your faith, you exercise your faith. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say. When you say, you're exercising your faith. You're applying your faith. You're working your faith. You're putting it in operation. So not only when you put your faith in operation, working it, are you releasing it, but you're also causing it to grow strong. Has a double effect, doesn't it? It's causing the faith to grow. It's also releasing, putting it in operation. Because you're going to say to this tree, be thou plucked up by the sea, the root and plant in the sea, and it should obey you. Another thing you must understand, it's still going on talking about faith here. Your faith is your servant. It has been given to you to serve you, to bring into being all the promises, to conquer all the works of the enemy, to give you victory in every situation. And he, he continues on. He hadn't stopped talking about this. He goes, but which of you, like if you have a red letter about Bible, you'll see it continues on in red, talking about Jesus speaking. Which, have, which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meat? If you have a servant who's supposed to serve you, do you tell him, don't do anything? No. You're going to tell him, get out there and do your job and serve me and bring me my food or bring me whatever I'm supposed to be getting from you. Will not rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup. Otherwise, get out there and do the work so I can eat. You know, Gird thyself, serve me till I've eaten and drunken. Afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. Otherwise, whatever a servant is serving you in some capacity, that's what faith is. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, or no, I think not, is what that means. So likewise, when you shall have done all these things that are commanded, you say, we're unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. A servant will do what it's designed to do. Your faith is your servant. 
You have been given a spirit of faith. You're to work your faith. Your faith will bring your healing. Your faith will bring your deliverance. Your faith will bring your prosperity. Your faith will bring in the promises. Your faith will move mountains. Your faith will give you victory. Your faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Your faith does, accomplishes all these things as God, you put him in operation. Otherwise, God has given you a, and I a spirit of faith that's our servant. Well, you've got to put it, make your servant serve you. If you don't put your faith in operation, your spirit of faith, is it going to do anything for you? No. You've got to put them in operation. Your faith will bring forth your healing as you take hold of healing, or your faith will cast out the demons and drive the demons out. Well, you can, if you don't put it in operation, it's not going to get the demons out. Otherwise, it is your servant. And you are going to put it into operation and it will produce the results in your life. Now, the devil knows this, so he wants to overthrow your faith. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, speaking to Peter, Behold, look. Behold means look or see. Behold, see, look. Hey, pay attention here. Satan has... The word desired is a form of the word aiteo, ex mai, which means to demand. He demands from you. The word have is a misleading there. It isn't there in the Greek. In the Greek, there's this word here, and then there's the word for you. If you look at Young's, he translates that the adversary did not ask, but demand you. He demands you. And what's he demanding you for? For himself. So he can destroy you. The reason why you know it is true, himself, because it's a middle voice verb. The middle voice means the subject is doing something for him. That's why it literally says, Satan demands you for himself. What's he want to do to you? <laughs> he wants to destroy you. That he may sift, and this in a figurative means, oh, cause, try, over, try, try the faith to overthrow it, to overthrow your faith from working. That's what he wants to do. The devil wants to overthrow your faith. You can't let that happen. Look at verse 32, and this is important to realize. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Does that mean his faith would automatically not fail? No. How do we know? You've got to look up the words. The word fail, it's not a statement of fact. It is a conditional statement. Subjunctive mood. Present tense. The way you would translate this, like Young's brings it out, that thy faith may not fail. I mean, it could fail, but it might not fail. It all depends on the conditions being met by you. And that's true. Your faith could move your mountain, or your faith may not move your mountain. Your faith can get you free of all the demons, or your faith might not do nothing, and they'll just stay in you and keep you bound. Your faith can take hold of your healing, or you may never see healing manifest in your life. It all depends whether we meet the conditions. The devil is trying to cause your faith to fail. Your faith could fail if you don't understand what's necessary and have faith and work your faith continually to see the results come to pass. So the devil's out to stop your faith. Evidence of that. What happens when the, you hear the word? The word comes into your heart, doesn't it? And what does the word produce in your heart? Specific faith. That then you mix your general spirit of faith by acting upon it. But what does the devil want to do then? He wants to get that source of faith out of you. Which is what? The word in your heart. So what's he going to do? The parable of the sower teaches us what happens in Luke 8, 12. Those are by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. The devil wants to get the word out of your heart. How can he get the word out of your heart if you don't believe it and act upon it? 
you don't, if you doubt it, if you don't put it in operation in your life, lest they should believe and be saved, or believe that they may be saved. That's what Young puts here, I meaning it's a subjunctive. It is. Otherwise, believe that they may be saved if they, put, if they truly believe, which means to put their faith in operation to see the result. And saved, by the way, that means all kinds of things. It means to be made well, to be healed, to be restored to health. It refers to um, deliverance as well, to be preserved, to be delivered from things that would come against you, to be saved from evils, all kinds of things. So salvation means being saved, healed, delivered, safe, restored, set free. So the devil is after the word because then your faith will not have, you won't even have faith to function. At the same time, he will do everything possible to try to stop your faith from working. This is why he comes with temptation to take the word out of your heart so the word's not in you, so your faith will not do anything for you. Or he will come, if it's working for a while, and try to get you into cares, worries, and anxieties. That'll choke the word so it won't produce anything. Or if, seek after the riches, deceitfulness of riches. Or after, or after the pleasures of this life. I just want the pleasures of the world. <laughs> That's the devil's temptation to take you down a path that'll lead you to destruction. It'll stop the word from producing fruit in you. What happens? You bring no fruit to perfection. No fruit, nothing. No healing, no deliverance, no peace, no prosperity, no blessing. Never happens because the devil has been successful. You've got to understand what the enemy is doing. We also see he will try your faith to get you into some kind of bondage. Look what it says here in James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The word fall means really to fall in, as being encompassed about by these diverse temptations. Otherwise, all these things have come against you. If you use your authority and you walk in line with the word, you can resist the enemy's attacks and not even have these situations occurring you occurring in your life because the angels will go before you, prepare the way, they'll protect you, guard you, keep you in all your ways. But if you don't put them in operation and the devil can come in and get to you because you don't know the word and haven't been doing things, you can be falling into all these temptations that are coming at you all over the place. What's going on? Knowing this, the trying of your faith, your faith is being tested. And who is coming to try to take your faith down? The devil wants to take your faith down. What's going to happen when your faith is being attacked by the enemy with all these temptations? It should work and bring into operation, perform or accomplish, steadfastness. This is what it's supposed to do when you do have an attack. Patience means steadfastness, and that is of the soulish realm. We'll show you a scripture that's important for you to know. You've seen it in the past, but it's important to see it right here. What does patience do for you in the soulish realm? Look what it says. Luke 21, 19. In your patience or your steadfastness, on what? On the word, in your mind. You possess your souls. You'll have control in the soulish realm so the enemy doesn't get to you. Where's the battleground with the devil? It's in the mind, or through the will, or through the emotions in the soul. I don't feel such and such a way. I feel all these things. Uh, he can take you all kinds of ways with feelings. Or thoughts, negative thoughts, get you evil thoughts, wrong thoughts, or get you not to be choosing the things of God. I don't feel like doing it, and all these kind of things. In your steadfastness on the word, you are possessing control in the soulless realm. The devil tries to get you to not do what the word says, not act upon it, not believe the word, not carry it out. In fact, he wants to get the word out of your heart. This is why when the temptation comes, as it says, this is the enemy attacking. The trying of your faith 
should work and bring into operation steadfastness in the soul so you don't give place to it. I'm steadfast in my mind. I'm not going to give place to it. I'm steadfast in the soul so I don't give place to this feeling that's a negative feeling coming at me that th things aren't going to work out for me or some lying thought or something that I just give up and not trust God or whatever it might be. Any kind of a lie he brings into your mind. Patience is to have its perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, which means complete, lacking nothing. This is why you got to have steadfastness of patience coupled together with your faith so you don't let the devil take you out of faith and hinder your faith from working. If he can get you not being steadfast on the word, you get doubting, you get wavering, you get wondering, you draw back, you go off some other direction. You're, you're not working your faith anymore. He's been successful. You need to be steadfast on doing what the word says. That is absolutely important. Now, another thing. God has given you faith to handle anything and everything that comes at you in life. He expects you to use your faith. He expected the disciples to use their faith. Look what happened here in Luke chapter 8, verse 22 and following. Came to pass on a certain day, he went into a ship with his disciples and said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake, and they launch forth. So now they're in the boat going to the other side. As they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm, a whirlwind, a tempestuous storm of wind, and this was a strong tempestuous wind, as it says, violent storm. Who stirred that one up? The devil. On the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy, in danger, in peril. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Now, is this a statement of releasing their faith? No. This is a statement of not believing anything that God will do. Instead, believing that the devil is going to be successful against them. Master, master, we perish. Is that going to put your faith in operation to conquer the enemy? No. That's just agreeing with what the devil's doing. What did he do? He arose. He rebuked the wind and the rage in the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He stopped it. And then what did he say? He said to them, where is your faith? That's quite a statement. In other words, he's saying, your faith should have been able to do this. Where's your faith? Why didn't you deal with this thing? He expected them to conquer the attack of the enemy, coming through the wind and all the things that were coming. They, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man's this? He commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. Remember, when he spoke commands, that was his faith in operation. And he's saying, where is your faith? Well, their faith was zero. They were saying, we're going to perish. <laughs> they were submitted to the devil's attack, essentially, by saying that. Words have power. They should have stood up and commanded that to cease in the name of Jesus. Well, and that's what we would do in, in the New Testament is. No, they didn't. He said, where is your faith? That's important. You must understand, you've got to conquer things. Mark chapter 4, verse 40, shows us something. He said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? When he arose and rebuked the wind, and it ceased, and it was a great calm. This is Mark's account. Luke says, Where's your faith? And now he's telling them what, why their faith was not right. Why are you so fearful? Why, why is it? How is it that you have no faith? Fear means no faith. You can't have a fear. You can't be afraid of the devil or afraid of what's going on. You can't be afraid of a sickness and disease. I've seen people be afraid of the cancer, and they don't get healed unless they get over that. You can't get free if you have fear. You've got to know what God will do. Fear means no faith. We can't doubt or stand in two ways. That also will shut down your faith from working. This is Peter 
He's walking on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30, when he saw, remember we talked about, we focus on the realm of the spirit. When something is happening in the natural, that the devil is stirred up, we got to function in the spirit. If we succumb and let what's going on in the natural affect us, we're going to be going down. That's what happened here. When he saw the wind, this violent, tempestuous, strong wind, boisterous, strong and mighty, Iskaros, the devil stirring this up, did he speak to it and command it to cease and stop and be calm? No. He was afraid. He got afraid. If you react to what the devil's attack is with a negative reaction, afraid, doubt, wonder, oh no, what's going to happen? You just shut down your faith. And what's going to happen? He began to sink, beginning to sink. Remember, he's doing a supernatural thing, walking on the water. Now, he's in fear. He's going down. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, notice what he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? The word doubt is the Greek word distazo, which means to sta two stands. Die is two. Stazo is from mean stand. Two stands. Otherwise, he had his eyes on Jesus, you know, but then he also he got moved by the wind that the devil stirred up. If you get moved by what the devil's doing, you are in two stands. You're in doubt land, and you're going to sink, and your faith will not conquer the enemies. You must come against the attack of the enemy to get you in fear or to get you into another stand, Otherwise, you're going to sink. He calls this little faith, having little faith or trusting too little. Another thing we see, you've got to watch your reasoning. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus, remember, he fed the 5,000, and here, there, verse 8, which Jesus perceived, said to them, O oh, ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves because you brought no bread? They were thinking in the natural. Was that going to feed all the people? No, Jesus was going to multiply it and meet all their needs, which is what he did. What was the problem? They were reasoning in their mind, trying to resolve this thing and figure it all out in their mind. If you don't guard your mind, you will have little faith. You, your mind is to be set on the Word of God. You need to think on what the Word says and be acting on what the Word says. God's going to perform that Word. If you start reasoning your mind and thinking all these other things and you're all over the place, you're now in little faith land. You're not going to see anything happen. We cannot be reasoning among ourselves or try, you know, and letting the devil get to us in the mind. See, where's the battleground? It's in the mind. He will try to work your mind. He'll try to bring emotions to you, feelings to you. He'll try to barrage you to get you to get wavering, you know, doubting, wondering, all these kind of things. These are attacks of the devil. When you know what God will do and you know your faith will eliminate every enemy and you know you just have to put it in operation, then why would you be reasoning and wondering what I should do? No. You already know what to do. You think correctly. Otherwise, you've got to guard your mind. That's why you've got to learn to take your thoughts captive. You've got to think on good things. You've got to get your mind stayed on the Word of God. That will keep in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed on thee. Remember that? Isaiah 26, 3? Stayed on it. It's propped up, leaned on it. It's focused. Well, if you get your mind off of that, you can get into anxiety and fears and worries and anxiety all over the place, you know. You lose your peace quickly. Reasoning means little faith. Unbelief also means no faith and no results. This is when, in answering them, why couldn't we cast them out? Notice, why couldn't Dunamai we cast them out? 
Why didn't we have the power to cast them out? He said, because of your unbelief. Unbelief will shut down your faith. We've got to, we cannot have any unbelief. Why would we not believe? That's the devil bringing that to you. You should believe everything that the Word of God says because it's the truth and it's what God will perform. And so that's when he says, hey, if you, if you, if you are having faith, if you have faith, and of course, that statement tells you it's a, it's a conditional statement. If you are having faith, means you got to be, you, you can't be in doubt, you can't be wavering, you can't be, you know, believe in unbelief, it's not going to happen. Then you're going to say to the mountain and you're going to command it and it will, be, it will be removed and nothing shall be impossible unto you. All things are possible to him that believeth. We need to develop our faith and work our faith and get ourselves to the place where we believe God's word and we will do exactly what it says because unbelief means no faith and no results. Look at some examples. Even Jesus was hindered from doing mighty works because of somebody else's unbelief. Look what it says. This is in Nazareth, Mark 6, 5. He could there do no mighty work save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. He couldn't do any mighty works. Why? Because of their, it was all because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. They were in unbelief. Amazingly. We see it also over in Matthew's account in chapter 13, verse 58. Matthew 13, 58. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Don't ever let unbelief in you. You believe, period. Anything that comes at you to get you not believe, that is the devil attacking you all the time. You must be ready to deal with that unbelief that's coming against you. It's the devil lying to you. At the same time, there will be pressure that comes against your faith. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience, steadfastness, and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations or pressures that you endure. These guys maintain steadfastness and faith in the midst of whatever came at them. Whatever attack comes at you, you should always be maintaining faith and steadfastness of soul, patience of hope, steadfast. Maintain it at all times. Don't let anything take you out of faith. Don't let anything take you out of hope. Don't let anything cause you not to be steadfast. That is an attack of the devil that is coming against you. And you need to hold on to it because your faith could crash and become shipwreck if you don't do what you need to do. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith. You're to be holding, on, holding faith, which means because you have the word and you're speaking the word and you're not giving place to anything that comes against it. You take all your thoughts captive, you resist every temptation, you hold up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one speaking the word. How did Jesus conquer, conquer the temptations? It's written, it's written, it's written. How are you going to conquer the temptations? It's written, it's written. You're going to speak the word, you're going to do what the word says. You're not giving place to anything that comes at you. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away, they put away their faith and their good conscience, put away concerning faith, they made it shipwreck. It crashed. Remember, your faith could fail. You can't let your faith fail. You can't let your faith go down. You can't let your faith get contaminated. You can't let your faith get affected in any way where it becomes little or becomes no, no faith, fear, any kind of thing. It can be made shipwreck. 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Well, those are people that are really in trouble. How do you depart from the faith? If you give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, such as God doesn't heal anymore. 
A lot of Christians say that today. That's a lie. Christians don't have any demons, so they don't need to cast anything out. That's a doctrine of the devil. You'll never cast them out of you ever if you believe that. You can't believe lies. Doctrines of devils, you've actually departed from the faith. Because what's the Bible say? These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. Everybody's supposed to do it. Therefore, you've got to make sure you don't have any false doctrines or deceiving, seducing spirits that will try to get a hold of you. Another thing. Some people, and this is one that's a real problem. People will, they start out in faith, but then they, they get another faith. 1 Timothy 5.12, having damnation or judgment because they have cast off their first faith. Well, that meant they went to another one. They tried something else. That's the guy that believes God will do such. And then he says, but I'm going to try this over here. I'll never forget this cancer case I was working on casting out. We've seen 22 people healed of cancer. And then one particular one who, this is not a good report, was casting out the demons. The guy was getting better and better and better and better. All of a sudden, the doctor came along and says, we got a really good medication that's going to get rid of this problem. I'm not against medication. But if your faith gets in the medication, it's not in God anymore, are you going anywhere with your faith? No. He got faith in that. And you know what? I never could hardly get hardly any demons out of him any longer. And he went downhill from that end and he would not, he followed that. He had a second faith. He followed another direction. He's not alive today. It shouldn't have happened. He was progressing well. I've seen that happen. I've seen the ones that have made it, and I've seen the ones that haven't. All the ones that have been healed are the ones that stayed focused and stayed casting out and taking hold of healing and did, didn't waver. Their faith worked continually, and they saw the victory. And that's true in any area. You just continue to keep your faith applied. Do not cast off your first faith for anything else. Don't try this and try that and try six different things at once. I've seen people do that all the time. Where's their faith really? Well, they're just grasping for anything that'll solve their problem instead of realizing God is your source. He is your healer and your deliverer and your victory. Don't cast off your faith. You also, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, says the love of money is the root of all evil, which some who coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You can err from the faith by getting into sin. Coveting is sin. That was a mistake. And then there's another place here in Timothy, many places where it discusses this. This is in the second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.8. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these who resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, or not approved. Otherwise, your faith could fail if it's not approved. Should that happen for anybody? No. Is it happening? Yeah. It shouldn't be happening. If you resist the truth and we don't do what the Word says, we let our mind get corrupted by the devil, these guys were reprobate concerning the faith. God wants you to understand that you are to operate in faith. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. Your faith will move every mountain, cast out every devil, take hold of every promise. It will bring into manifestation everything that God says. It's what you live by, what you walk by. It's what you, without faith, you can't please Him. It's impossible to please Him. It is what brings forth every victory in your life through your spirit of faith that you act on the Word, putting it in operation, working your faith continuously, speaking things into being, commanding the works of His hands, putting your faith in operation, operating in the realm of the Spirit, not considering the natural, not considering what's going on in the natural. It has no effect whatsoever. Peter should have never considered what was going on in the natural. He should have just commanded that thing to cease, the wind to cease. That's why Jesus says, where's your faith? Now, that's not saying that, you know, that they, well, how did they know to do that? He'd already taught them all that. He would never say, where's your faith, if they weren't even taught that already. They already knew. But they were in unbelief. 
they didn't do what he said. God wants you to get your faith perfected. He wants your faith strong. He wants you to work your faith. It is to grow exceedingly. You are to guard your faith and not let the enemy get to your faith. Remember, the word in you is the source of faith. It's then you mix it with the general spirit of faith. So you've got to keep the word in you. If he gets the word out of you, you don't have any faith operating. And you've got to maintain hope. So you've got to have a confident expectancy. You've got to govern that soulish realm. You cannot let the devil get to you in your mind or the motions or will. Anything that gets you off track, he's successful. And then your faith would fail. Your faith is not to fail. The devil demands to get every one of us and to try to destroy us. But Jesus wants your faith to work, to bring forth every promise and every victory and you can conquer everything. And we'll close with this scripture for tonight. 1 John, the one that we saw this morning we closed with, 1 John 5, 4. Whosoever is born of God, are you born of God? If you're born of God, this is talking to you and me. Conquers and carries off the victory. That's what this word means. Of the world. And this is the victory that conquers and carries off the victory. Even our faith. Your faith, your servant. You got the faith of Jesus Christ. He wants you to work your faith continually. Never turn away from faith and continually put it in operation as long as it takes to see the promise or see the deliverance or see the victory or see whatever it is. You just keep on putting it in operation and you will see God will perform it however long it takes. You've got to make sure you're in faith, though. You've got to correct all these problems. That's why he says, hey, we, got to, we want to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. If the devil can get you into little faith or no faith or unbelief or any of these things, getting you reasoning, fear, reacting negatively, he's got you. He stopped your faith from working. So we've got to correct all these problems. Make sure, just the first scripture we saw, examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Test yourself whether you're in the faith. Do you govern your mind? What kind of words come out of your mouth? Are you moved by the emotions? Are you getting fear? Do you react negatively? Have you cast off the first one? Oh, I got three other ways I'm trying to do something. <laughs> God's not your source. You just made a whole bunch of other things your source. So we need to correct all those problems. When we come in line with the word and we truly trust in him, your faith will bring victory for you in your life. God swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. We talked about that this morning. And he will perform his promise in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the faith of Jesus Christ. I have a spirit of faith that I can mix with the word of God that brings specific faith that I can work continuously in the realm of the spirit to bring forth every promise into being. Conquer every devil, every enemy. Move every mountain. I thank you. My faith is my servant. My servant will serve me as I put it in operation to bring forth everything that God wants in my life. All the promises. Just as Jesus upheld all things, brought things into being by the spoken word of his power, which was faith being worked, I will work my faith and I will guard myself. I will not let the devil cause my faith to fail or be shipwrecked or unapproved or get into doubt or fear or become little faith or even no faith. I will not get in unbelief. I believe the word. I will do what it says. I will work my faith with power. The promises will come to pass. I will be delivered. I will be healed. I will be set free. All the promises will come to pass because I work my faith. Thank you for giving me the faith that will bring total victory in every area of my life. 
I will work my faith every day of my life. And I thank you for bringing total victory in every area. In Jesus' name, amen. This is spiritual reality. So you know how the devil works. You saw a lot of the ways the devil will work. Think about your own life. Has he been able to work you in different ways to kind of, I can see how he's got to me and he got me off track. Yeah, he brought these thoughts in my mind. Yeah, he got me to try some other ways. Uh, the emotions came and I just, or he got me looking at the natural instead of focusing on the word and keeping my faith applied. I got two stands, double-minded, whatever. Anything that's happened, correct it. Get it corrected. Get ourselves in faith. Watch what God will do because his word will absolutely come to pass. Father, I thank you for all that you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word and correct all the problems, and we will see our faith bring forth victory in every area of our life. Thank you for much fruit as we're hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen.